little over... Nowadays, everything possible is done to put the patient at ease. First, a quick-acting anaesthetic is injected through a vein into the bloodstream. Within seconds, he becomes unconscious and is then kept insensible to pain through the operation by means of anaesthetic gases. In the old days, conditions were vastly different. In some hospitals, a bell clanged ominously to summon attendants to strap down the patient or to hold him securely while the surgeon applied the knife. Even the simplest operation was a grim ordeal. The patient was brought to the operating theater either fully conscious or with senses dulled by alcohol. This operation bell, hanging in a London hospital, is a reminder of these dreadful days. But grimmer evidence is provided by the work of artists and cartoonists who found, in the horrors of old-time surgery, a fascinating, if depressing, theme for their skill. James Young Simpson, a Scottish doctor, was one of the great benefactors of mankind whose researches ended the nightmare of the old-time operation. His contribution was the discovery of the anaesthetic effects of chloroform. The seventh son of a baker, Simpson was born at Basket, a village near Edinburgh. The house on the left was his home. He was a brilliant boy and at the age of 14 was sent to Edinburgh University. Despite his youth and village background, he was a lad of pith as they said in those days, determined to succeed. Soon he was hard at work, often studying long into the night. The medical course lasted four years. The subjects of study, including Latin, Greek, natural philosophy, chemistry, botany, anatomy, medicine and surgery. The final examination was all in Latin. Simpson saw his first operation when he was 16. In anguish, he fled from the infirmary to Parliament House, resolved to be done with medicine to enter the legal profession. Fortunately, this was not to be. First, his basket friend and fellow student, John Reed, pleaded that it would be folly to throw away two years of study. Later, back at the university, an old clerk reminded him of mankind's age-long search for some means of relieving pain of the many drugs which had been tried, and of experiments with freezing, pressure, and mesmerism, all without complete success. Conditions in the operating theater were, therefore, still a challenge to the student, not a reason for retreat. In this way, Simpson was persuaded to continue his studies. Charles Darwin also had been distressed by his first sight of an operation, but he never returned to his medical course. When 18, Simpson qualified as a member of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, and two years later as a doctor of medicine. When he was only 28, this odd letter marked his appointment as Professor of Obstetrics at Edinburgh University. And as his practice grew, the search for a drug that would render the patient unconscious while not interfering with the natural functions became with him almost an obsession. Others, too, were experimenting to the same purpose. Crawford Williamson Long, physician and surgeon of Georgia. The dentist, Horace Wells of Hartford, Connecticut. Charles Thomas Jackson, of Massachusetts. And William Thomas Green Morton, dentist of Boston. It was Morton's use of ether in a major operation for the removal of a tumor that fired the imagination of medical men everywhere. Morton's anesthetizing equipment was simple a spherical glass vessel containing a sponge soaked in ether. The gas was inhaled by the patient through a tube in the mouth. Afterwards, the surgeon, Dr. J. Collins Warren, exclaimed to those who had come to scoff, gentlemen, this is no humbug. The operation took place at the Massachusetts General Hospital on October the 16th, 1846. Today, a plaque in the old theater commemorates the historic occasion. Four months later, the first British operation under ether was performed by Dr. Robert Liston 
at University College Hospital London. At the end, he declared, this Yankee Dodge beats mesmerism hollow. Simpson was first in Britain to use ether to ease the pain of childbirth. But he disliked its disagreeable smell, the irritation it caused to the lungs sometimes, and the large quantities which had to be used. He was looking for a drug which, as he put it, might be found to possess the advantages of ether without its disadvantages. Simpson and his assistants, Dr. Matthews Duncan and Dr. George Keith, carried out their experiments at Simpson's home at 52 Queen Street, Edinburgh. By inhalation, they tested many volatile drugs, including chloride of hydrocarbon, aldehyde, nitrate of oxide of ethyl, benzene, and bisulfurate of carbon. It was David Waldy, a Liverpool manufacturing chemist, who suggested Simpson should test per chloride of forma. Waldy's contribution is commemorated by this plaque at his hometown of Linlithgow. It was on November the 4th, 1847, that Simpson decided to try out Waldy's suggestion. He recalled to his colleagues that some years earlier, per chloride of four mile, later known as chloroform, had been discovered by several chemists. Soubiron in France, Liebig in Germany, and Samuel Guthrie in America. And that the chemical composition of pure chloroform was first accurately described by the famous French scientist, Professor Dumas, in 1835. Simpson was the first to inhale the vapor, the others following. Quickly the scene changed. The effects were similar to those of ether, and the three doctors were soon in a state of elation. While the experiment was going on, Mistress Simpson, her sister, Miss Grindley, and niece, Miss Petrie, were in another room chatting. There was a sudden crash. Mrs. Simpson found the men unconscious, but her husband's speedy recovery put her fears at rest. As she helped to raise him, he lifted his glass and said, this is far better and stronger than ether. Dr. Duncan was snoring loudly. Dr. Keith lay on the floor, kicking out violently. When they had recovered, the excitement was intense. Who would be next to test the drug? Not me, said Mrs. Simpson. She'd seen too many of these tests. Nor me, said Miss Grindley. But Miss Petrie was not only ready, but anxious to try the drug that had overcome her uncle and his friends. Watched closely by the others, she sniffed. A little apprehensively at first, the glass of chloroform handed to her by Simpson. Then, Spurred on by the doctors, she breathed in more deeply. As she slipped into unconsciousness, she sighed, I'm an angel. Within a few days, chloroform was put to the test in the operating theatre of Edinburgh Infirmary. Simpson's friend, Professor Miller, was surgeon, and Simpson himself administered the chloroform to the first patient a Gaelic-speaking boy with a diseased bone in the arm. As no one present could speak Gaelic, it was not possible to tell the boy what was about to happen. Simpson used the simplest possible method of administering the chloroform, sprinkling the drug onto a handkerchief held over the boy's face, in what was to become known later as the rag and bottle method. Professor Dumas, who chanced to be in Edinburgh, watched with the keenest interest the experiment with the drug which he had identified. At first the boy struggled, but after a few inspirations, Dumas was thrilled to see how easily and quickly the boy passed into a deep, snoring sleep.
as was usual in those days, the surgeon removed his jacket and operated in shirt sleeves. But most of the others present wore their outdoor clothing. By the time the patient was back in bed, a Gaelic-speaking student had been found to tell him that the operation was over. The boy could hardly believe it. He'd felt no pain. Simpson's hopes had been fulfilled, and his faith justified. He lost no time in preparing the announcement of his discovery. Only three days after the first operation, he read to the Medico Chirurgical Society of Edinburgh his account of a new anaesthetic agent as a substitute for ether in surgery and midwifery. He didn't know at the time that the French scientist Fleurent had already carried out tests with chloroform, but on animals, not humans. It was fortunate that Simpson was a dour and determined fighter, for soon he was being vehemently attacked for using chloroform in childbirth. This, his critics said, was interference with the divine law. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. Simpson's quick reply was this pamphlet. Medical men and ministers, he wrote, will oppose in vain the use of anesthesia, for our patients themselves will force the use of it upon the profession. It was in the Bible he found the perfect answer. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. John Snow, an English doctor who had begun to specialize in administering ether at London hospitals, was soon using chloroform both for operations and in childbirth. The seal of royal approval was set on Simpson's work when he received a letter announcing that Snow had given the drug to Queen Victoria during the birth of Prince Leopold. Her Majesty, the letter said, had never recovered better from any confinement. Tribute of another kind came during the Franco-Prussian War, when an Edinburgh firm of manufacturing chemists received orders to supply chloroform to both sides to ease the agony of the wounded. As the use of ether, chloroform and nitrous oxide was extended, new techniques of administration were developed. Most of the early inhalers were designed to enable the vapor to be administered directly through the mouth. Later models were based on inhalation through the nose. This is Snow's ether inhaler. And the chloroform inhaler, which he devised after many experiments. In 1853, Alexander Wood produced the first glass syringe and hollow needle to inject morphia under the skin. Pain in surgery was finally conquered. Meantime, at Glasgow University, Professor Lister had demonstrated and emphasized the profound importance of antiseptics in the practice of surgery. As a result of Lister's great work on antiseptics, the very high death rate associated with operations was reduced dramatically. With anaesthetics today, there's a wide range to choose from according to the patient's condition and the surgeon's requirements. In minor cases, as in dentistry, a local anaesthetic may be sufficient. In operations of greater extent or severity, a general anaesthetic is given either by injection or by inhalation or by a combination of both methods. Whatever the circumstances, the anaesthetist's task is to ensure that the patient, while insensible, receives an adequate supply of oxygen while the anaesthetic is working. The pulse and breathing are kept under close observation and a record made of the patient's reactions throughout the operation. Confusion has given place to order. Masks Sterilized gowns and gloves have replaced outdoor clothing in the theater. The surgeon operates in an atmosphere of calm, free from the desperate need for haste of pre-anesthetic days. Operations once undreamed of are now carried out with perfect safety, the patient being kept unconscious for hours if need be. It's a far cry from the days of the screaming patient and the sweating surgeon. Aseptic surgical technique and the safe care of the anesthetized patient have robbed the operating theatre of its terror. Honours were heaped upon Simpson 
and his memory is enshrined in his Edinburgh home in Queen Street, where the discovery of chloroform's anaesthetic qualities was made. And in this statue, the shadow of Edinburgh's historic castle. The Scottish baker's son not only conquered pain, he helped to give life and hope to millions.